Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this evening's lecture of the Royal Philosophical Society. Uh, I'm Richard Service. Uh, at the lecture a fortnight ago, uh, we were told that medics don't wear ties. Um, so, uh, not so as some accountants. So, yes, as it happens, I'm the society's treasurer with a tie. Um, three brief admin uh, uh, remarks. Uh, first, if there are some spare seats at the edge, it might help if you could move along a wee bit to let um, the latecomers come in. Secondly, if the fire alarm sounds, uh, get out. And remember, as they say in all the best aircraft, the nearest available exit may be behind you. Um, and thirdly, uh, mobile phones, please, 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 please either switch them off or turn them to silent. Uh, I don't think you'd like to have the embarrassment of being the person whose phone suddenly goes off halfway through the lecture. And if you're unsure if your phone's off, uh, now's your chance to check it. Uh, this evening, uh, it's the Adam Smith Lecture, and I'm delighted to introduce Professor Sir John Kay, one of Britain's leading economists. Uh, he's worked in acad academia, think tanks, business schools, has held company directorships, consultancies, and has advised investment companies. And he was a, a member of uh, the First Minister's Standing Council on Europe from its inception in 2016 till its demise in 2020. Um, interesting Scottish connection. I was first uh, aware of John Key in the 1980s in reading his book he co-authored with Mervyn King uh, the British tax system, and I still have my yellowed copy here. It was a, a real page turner, uh, at least in my humble opinion. Um, in The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith sets out four criteria for a good tax system. One, it should be imposed in accordance with ability to pay. Two, the amount must be certain, objectively quantified. And thirdly, the cost of tax collection should be as low as possible and fourthly, the method of collecting tax should be as simple as possible. In preparation for this evening, I got out my uh, original copy of the third edition of Kay and King on the British tax system, and I searched your book for reference to Adam Smith, none explicitly, I'm sad to say, so failed on that. But however, I did see that um, John Kay and Mervyn King's conclusion was that the British tax system is a mess, no one would design such a system in purpose, and in fact, no one has designed it. Um, thus, um, although they don't refer to Adam Smith's criteria, I reckon they had Dr. Smith in mind, and they had tested our tax system against um, his criteria. At that time in the 1980s, it was a comprehensive fail. Uh, perhaps it's a lot worse now. Uh, his most recent book published in 2020, co-authored with Paul Collier, who gave the Bowman Lecture to us a year ago, is titled Greed is Dead. Adam Smith's writing, I am pleased to say, are considered by uh, Paul Collier and John Kay. And in a very surprising and intriguing way. But to find out why you'll have to buy the book, because it's time for me to sit down and to invite Professor Kay to, in, to speak to us on From the Pin Factory to the iPhone, the Complete History of Capitalism. Well, thank you, Richard. And thank you all for braving this freezing Glasgow night uh, to be here with us tonight to talk about Adam Smith. Now, I know why you asked me to come and talk about Adam Smith. There is only one known likeness of the great man, and it is this one. It is a, a caricature by John Kay. John Kay of Edinburgh uh, drew many of the great figures of the Scottish Enlightenment at the end of the 18th century, when Adam Smith was in his heyday. And this is his drawing of Smith. With the aid of our modern artificial intelligence tools, I'm hoping next year to be able to come and put myself where I should be in this particular, in, in this particular sketch. Uh, but actually, um, 
John Kay, who caricatured Adam Smith, was not the only John Kay of the 18th century who played a major part in the reform and industrialization and development of modern economies. There was also John Kay, inventor of the flying shuttle. Um, John Kay, inventor of the flying shuttle. There are lots of doubtful things about this particular painting, which hangs in Manchester Town Hall. But this is John Kay being forced to flee for his life after being pursued by a variety of handloom weavers who feared correctly that they would be put out of work by John Kay's invention. That's an event that has resonance for our times as well. But so also does the story of the other John, another John Kay of the 18th century. Uh, John Kay was inventor of the spinning jenny. However, I don't have a picture of the spinning jenny or that John Kay to show to you because John Kay was upstaged in that by a man called Richard Arkwright. If you think Richard Arkwright looks like a, a picture of the bloated capitalist, there is something to be said for that um, description. He was a major mill owner. He was, by the end of the uh, 18th century, uh, one of the richest men in England, possibly the richest man in England. But Richard Arkwright was not a, a capitalist of the, or did not begin as a capitalist of the Marxist kind. Arkwright, after he'd become Sir Richard, supposedly in a conversation with Lord so-and-so, in which Lord so-and-so began by saying, is it true, Sir Richard, that you began your working life as a barber? To which Sir Richard supposedly replied, yes, indeed, Lord so-and-so. And if you had started the barber, I think you might be a barber still. <laughs> The thing about Sir Richard Arkwright was, I don't think he was a very nice man. He stole John Kay's invention. But Sir Richard Arkwright was someone who put together the bits of accumulating capital, practical knowledge of how to run a business, and equip people to make the spinning jennies, which John Kay had invented. So Richard Arkwright was, in that sense, genuine entrepreneur. And we'll come back to that kind of entrepreneurship uh, later in this talk this evening. But let's begin where Adam Smith begins, which is, of course, in the pin factory. We all know that uh, Adam, uh, that, that, that Smith began the wealth of nations with a description of a pin factory. What um, he wrote was, uh, if I can um, get, get the right quote, uh, that one man draws out uh, the, the wire, another man cuts it, a fourth points it, a fifth grinds it at the top for receiving the head. Two or three distinct operations are required to put on the head of the pin. It is a trade in itself to put them into the paper, and so on, and so on. That was Adam talking about the pin factory. Adam Smith, Smith describes his visit to a pin factory. There's just one problem with all of this story and Adam Smith's beginning with a pin factory is it doesn't seem likely that Smith actually ever went to a pin factory. The um, description which he uh, makes of the pin factory comes rather close to what is in this diagram here. And this diagram here is from Diderot's French Encyclopedia, published shortly before The Wealth of Nations. And not only was it published shortly before the, the Wealth of Nations, but if you visit Glasgow University Library, where Smith was a professor at the time, uh, you will discover Smith withdrawing and returning, a record of his withdrawal and return of Diderot's Encyclopedia. Uh, worse than that, uh, Smith was actually accused by Adam Ferguson, another great figure of the Scottish Enlightenment, of having plagiarized the story of the pin factory uh, because Ferguson apparently had talked about the division of labor and the pin factory 
in a lecture well before the publication of The Wealth of Nations. And Diderot, uh, Ferguson confessed that he, Ferguson, had actually stolen the story of the pin factory from, uh, uh, from Diderot. So Smith had not been to a pin factory. Smith, curiously, almost certainly had been to a nail factory because nails na were a product of Kirkcaldy, where, of course, Smith was born and brought up. Uh, but making nails is very different from making pins. Uh, making nails, then, was an art artisanal activity undertaken by blacksmiths. We have records of um, not a Kirkcaldy nail factory, but an American nail factory, because Thomas Jefferson, among many other things, uh, uh, operated a nail factory. And this is a report to Jefferson on the proceedings in the nail factory. And you can see that uh, far from it being the kind of organization that Diderot had described, there were individuals making nails. And actually, the Jefferson's uh, house at Monticello, the people who run that, have produced, if you're interested, and I very much doubt it, but you have access, if you want it, to a video that explains how nails were made in the 18th century. Uh, and they were made individually by one person who took a nail from the raw material and fashioned it into a male. And you'll see that Jim makes 15 pounds, not 20 pounds, pence for it. Barnaby makes only 10 pounds and only got 10 pence. And four boys make eight pounds, and between them, they only collected sixpence for it. It's possible that in writing about uh, the pin factory, Smith was actually contrasting the mass production of nails with the, uh, and the mass production of pins with the artisanal production uh, uh, of, um, of nails. But we will never know. And does it matter? Many of you will know that Harvard Business School teaches predominantly by reference to cases who told some story of business in the past and the class are supposed to discuss this and learn from it. From time to time, it's discovered that the facts in these cases are wrong. And people at Harvard wonder from time to time what they should do about this. There are three options. One is to forget about the whether it's right or wrong, and carry on anyway. Another is to substitute the correct facts for the wrong ones. And a third option is to find some other way of teaching, whatever the point of the exercise is. And they continue out to argue about that. But actually, all that argument seems to be beside the point. When I talk about the division of labor and the pin factory, my students do not need to know how nails or pins were made in the 19th century. What they do need to know is the importance of the division of labor, which is the point Smith was making when he told that particular story about the pin factory. So what we need to think about is not uh, the details of pin or nail manufacture two centuries ago. We need to try and look at the lessons which Smith uh, drew from the pin factory and asked to what extent they're still valid and relevant today. And Smith drew, I think, three interrelated lessons from his description of the pin factory. The first was the importance of the division of labor. That is the separation of a production process into multiple different ta tasks in which people could be specialized. So the, the division of labor. And the division of labor was only possible by virtue of a business organization which has shown combination and coordination. So combination and coordination went with the division of labor. And the third was the effectiveness of collective intelligence. And what I want to do in this talk today is to talk about these lessons that Smith drew from the pin factory, the division of labor, the importance of combination and coordination and the effectiveness of, uh, of collective intelligence. And these things are as important today, though in somewhat different respects, as they were 
two and a half centuries ago, smoking throw tobacco. So let me begin by talking a little about the third of these, which is collective intelligence. The term collective intelligence has been popularized by an American Canadian evolutionary um, anthropologist called Joseph Henry. And I'm glad to say that he has just been awarded uh, by, in Edinburgh, the Panmure House Prize for his work, and particularly for his work on a book uh, called The Secret of Our Success. You might think that's a self-help manual. Um, I have to say it's not. It is quite a lot better than that. And it really is says that the development of collective intelligence has been the source of our economic development, our economic success, our current prosperity. What I, one of the things I like about Henry, in some ways it's the most important book in economics I think I've read in the, in the last decade, interestingly, not written by an economist. But that I've written that the, the lesson of that book is the importance of collective intelligence. And it brings of the kind of broad scholarship that was characteristic of the work of Adam Smith two and a half centuries ago. What do I mean by collective intelligence? And what does Henrik mean in talking about the progress of collective intelligence? It's quite useful, I think, to distinguish collective intelligence from collective knowledge. Collective knowledge is the point that all of us taken together in this room, no more than any of us individually know. That collective knowledge is what we have in Wikipedia, the totality of all the things that have people have found out in the last uh, two millennia of philosophizing and scholarship. That's collective knowledge. But collective knowledge, intelligence, is the business of turning that into problem-solving capabilities. That's what we mean by collective intelligence. And let me take an example to illustrate from what is perhaps the most banal and certainly uh, most extraordinary phenomenon of this kind, which is running. You probably didn't come here tonight expecting to hear a lecture about running. And I have to confess, I don't know very much about running myself, but I hope I know enough to keep my head above water for a few minutes longer. Running is one of the things that we've got better at in the 20th and 21st century. And that's pretty extraordinary because people have been running for thousands of years. Uh, but yet, many of you will have watched the film Chariots of Fire. If you did, you might or might not remember that Harold Abrahams won the 100 meters at the 1926 uh, Olympics in a time of 10.6 seconds. Today, the world record for the 100 meters is held by Usain Bolt in 9.58 seconds. You might notice, firstly, that the time is better, and secondly, that the timing is better as well, that we've improved both at running and we've improved chronography in, in chronometry. But actually, sprinting is um, relatively disappointing compared with other, um, with other running. Uh, the longer the distance, the be relatively better we have got at it. The first marathon, uh, uh, Olympic marathon, was held in 1896 at the very first Greek Olympics. And it was one gold medal in that marathon was one in a time of just under three minutes, uh, three hours. To, back in 2019, Eli Kipchoge, the Ethiopian, ran for the first time a marathon in less than two minutes, rather than two hours. That is, we're down from three hours to two hours. Um, quite a dramatic improvement in timing. Um, and um, uh, if you took the New York Marathon, which was run recently around the five, the, the five boroughs of New York, then 2,000 people in that marathon clocked up times which would have won them gold medals in that 1896 Olympic. We have got a lot better at doing that kind of thing. 
How have we done it? Well, we've done it by a combination of learning about nutrition, of learning about sports technique, of, and most of all, of cooperation and competition. I can hardly think of anything that illustrates the combination of cooperation and competition better than 2,000 people running very fast marathons round the five boroughs of New York. It's that, that in Henry's terms, is the secret of our success. In order to do that, we need to turn this collective knowledge which we've been accumulating about running, about sports, nutrition, about everything else, we need to turn it into a combination. But also, we might notice, and uh, uh, Smith uh, had a lot to say, as we recognized, about the division of labor. And the division of labor is being limited by the extent of the market. That's as relevant to running as it is to economics. Because if you go back to that film of the, the chariots of fire, you will, it will not have escaped your notice that all of the participants in these events were white men who had been to elite universities in Britain or the United States. Uh, Eli Kipchoge does not come to the, into that category, nor does Usain Bolt. Actually, uh, the people who win sprints nowadays are almost without exception, people who have uh, some genetic West African connection, but who have been brought up culturally either in the United States or the Caribbean and have the benefits of the nutrition and sporting knowledge that is, is there. Interestingly, while people of West African genetic origin dominate the, sh the sprints, people of East African genetic origin dominate, uh, um, uh, dominate the marathons. In the last 30 years, all marathon get gold medals in long distance running have been won by people from Kenya or um, uh, from Kenya or Ethiopia or other countries in East Africa. So broaden the, the extent of the market has improved our ability to run fast distances as well as everything else. So the division of labor and the extent of the market are important. The division of labor works, however, only if we can operate them in competition. And I introduced you uh, uh, a few moments ago to Sir Richard Arkwright, whose achievement was actually to make the combination of factors which made the spinning jenny one of the things that contributed greatly to the Industrial Revolution. I've always enjoyed this story. Unfortunately, it's apocryphal uh, that George Bush told Tony Blair that the trouble with the French is they don't have a word for entrepreneur. But it's worth taking a moment to think back to the original French meaning of entrepreneur, because an entrepreneur is someone who puts things together. Entrepreneur means French originally means take between. And that's what, what we've historically meant by entrepreneurship. In German, the word is Unternehmer, which has the same origin, the person who takes from one place to another. The essential characteristic of entrepreneurship is this ability to combine. And it's the division of labor and specialization together with the ability to create combinations uh, that is uh, a source of so much of our economic success. And that's why I titled this talk from the pin factory to the iPhone. Because the iPhone, as we'll see in many ways, is a combination of things. And most of all, if you think about the things that you can do on the smartphone, you will realize that there's nothing you can do on that phone which you couldn't do in some way already. We had phones, of course. We had messaging systems. We had maps. We had, um, you could ring, you could telephone and get a taxi. Uh, you could uh, watch the news and get the weather. Everything that is on your smartphone, you could do in some other way to before. The extraordinary thing about the smartphone is that you can do them all with one single device which you can put in your pocket. 
the essence of the iPhone in this sense is a combination. And we'll see in, in due course uh, that Apple, the pioneer and dominant producer of smartphones, is characterized by this kind of combination of activities. And that's true uh, throughout modern production system. Probably the most complex mass manufactured product which we have today is the civil aircraft. And as you know, the world aircraft market is dominated now by two producers, Boeing in the United States and Airbus in Europe. Airbus epitomizes the idea of combination of this kind. The wings of an Airbus are made at Broughton in North Wales. The, the fuselages of an Airbus are made in Gaddafi, in Gaddafi in Spain. This is um, called the Beluga, the Airbus Whale, which is a gigantic aircraft, which is dedicated yet to the idea of picking up parts from all around Europe and taking them for final assembly in the Airbus factory at U uh, Toulouse. There is a whole set of complicated, complicated logistics which enable the bits of the Airbus to come together in some one, one single operation in an assembly in, in Toulouse. And that's the nature of, uh, of this kind of mass production. There is literally nobody in the world who knows how to build an Airbus, but 10,000 people around Europe taken together do. This is specialization, division of labor, and combination, which enables us to produce these extraordinarily complex products linked with the development of collective intelligence, because it's barely more than 100 years since the first manned flight actually took place. But if we think about the developments of collective knowledge and collective intelligence, which have happened across that, uh, across that century, you can see how the modern civil aircraft is not the product of any individual's genius or um, amazing breakthrough. It's the product of an accretion of little bits of knowledge which have enabled us to produce this extraordinarily complex product which does so much today. So the Airbus is, in this fundamental sense, about combination and uh, cooperation. And the underlying division of labor. What happens to that Airbus uh, once it's come off the production line in Toulouse? Well, all of you will have been, I imagine all of you will have been in an aircraft uh, operated by some airline. You may think that when you see the logo of an airline in the fuselage, that the aircraft you're flying in is owned by the airline which, um, uh, whose, uh, whose name you see. It's very unlikely that that is the case. The largest owner of aircraft in the world is a company called Aircap, headquarters in Dublin. It is, as I say, the largest owner of aircraft in the world. It does not employ any pilots, any at all, but it does employ uh, quite a large number of accountants, information technology people, and um, tax advisors. Um, Aircap, um, it goes, becomes more extreme than that. Aircap may own the planes, uh, but the engines on the plane will not be owned by Aircap. When an airline buys, or buys in inverted commas, an aircraft, it actually leases that uh, the, the, that um, that aircraft from a business like Aircraft, and there are many other uh, opportunities like that. If any of you in this room want to, uh, you can actually buy a share in an aircraft. I actually own a tiny share of a uh, of an Airbus. It's a very small bit of an Airbus three hundred and eighty, but I don't. I was going to say I don't really know what it is. I do know that it's a fra tiny fraction the whole air, Airbus. That's some of the nature of capital ownership. But as I say, the, air, the aero engines are not owned by the airline either. What an airline uh, 
trying to operate an Airbus or any other civil aircraft in this, is it buys a 10-year contract for engine services from a producer of engines like Rolls-Royce or Pratt & Whitney in the US or General Electric. These are the three major manufacturers of aircraft engines to stay in the world. So the airline will decide to buy engine services from, uh, from these firms, and it will sign a 10-year contract with Rolls-Royce, as it were, to buy right. engine services. That may mean different engines over the 10 years of the contract. It's up to Rolls-Royce can decide if it wants to replace the engine and put another one, and from time to time it will do that. However, you might think Rolls-Royce owns the engines. It doesn't. Rolls-Royce will typically pass the, uh, the engine ownership on to another, to another firm. The largest supplier of Rolls-Royce engines is actually a firm called, or the largest owner of Rolls-Royce engines is actually a firm called GATX, which also owns many of the uh, 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 many, much of the rolling stock that operates. For example, uh, you may remember the beginning of this year, there was a collision and uh, uh, roller, rolling stock came off the rails in Palestine, not Palestine, in Middle East, Palestine, in Ohio, or perhaps it was Indiana. And anyway, that which spread toxic waste around an area of the United States, that uh, that rolling stock was actually owned not by the, the railroad, it was owned by GATX. And this goes on if you drive past an Amazon warehouse, which has Amazon painted in large letters on the side. You may think that Amazon owns that warehouse. It almost certainly doesn't. You may think when the Amazon van drives up to your front door, and that Amazon owns that, that, that van. It's unlikely that it does. Amazon doesn't, in fact, own anything except uh, the, um, uh, the rather large amount of cash, which actually is actually accumulated from successfully operating that business. And it becomes more bizarre than that. The, the main profit driver of Amazon is not, as you might think, uh, the, the business of selling good retail goods to you online. The major profits of Amazon actually come from an activity called Amazon Web Services, which is actually selling computer services to uh, other major companies around the world. Amazon's strength lies not in, in retailing in the way that traditionally Sears' strengths or Marks and Spencer's strengths lay in being good retailer. It lies in the information technology capabilities, which enables it to maintain that stock and to deliver them so efficiently to you. And these information technology capabilities are sold to other firms. That means, of course, that Amazon has uh, uh, requires very large amounts of computer power and computer services. You might think of that Amazon owns uh, these data centers but you'll see where this argument is going. It doesn't, of course. The data services are largely owned by distinct data center providers. The largest supplier to Amazon is a company called Equinox and so on. Now, you can begin to see firstly how extensive that division of labor that Adam Smith had talked about has now become. These modern businesses have uh, taken the division of labor to a degree that no one could really have conceived of. Uh, way back in, the, in, in, even in the 20th century, Henry Ford had the idea that he needed to control every aspect of the prediction process, uh, which, um, uh, which produced a Ford car. He, there's even an area of Brazil called, still called Fordlandia. That is where Ford created a rubber plantation in the belief that only uh, Ford rubber would be appropriate for the manufacture of tires for Ford cars. 
we've now gone to completely the opposite direction. So that the manufacturer of that iPhone, well, I shouldn't say manufacturer, that, uh, that iPhone has Apple on its, uh, the, the name Apple on its box and uh, on the phone. Uh, it's not made by Apple. In fact, nothing is made by Apple. If you look at the box, it will say designed in California. And it is. That's what Apple does. It creates the combination that puts together the smartphone. The largest assembler of, uh, of iPhones is actually a company called Foxconn, which is a su subsidiary of a Taiwanese company which operates on the Chinese mainland. That's who assembles uh, for iPhones. But actually, the cost of assembling an iPhone is a trivial part of the total cost of the iPhone. The iPhone is built from parts which are brought in, from a whole variety of parts which are brought in from various suppliers. And paradoxically, the largest supplier of components for the iPhone is actually Samsung, who of course are Apple's major competitor in the, in the smartphone factory, in the smartphone This is what uh, is now often called the hollow corporation. The business which is simply engaged in a combination and that it has no other activities other than combina the activity of combination. That's the nature of Amazon. That's the nature of Apple. That's the nation and the, the nature of so many modern firms. This is the era of the hollow corporation in which corp far from the integrated process of the pin factory or Henry Ford's automobile plants, uh, every aspect of the production process is separated to some specialist provider. And the hollow corporation can be of the form that Apple and Amazon are. But there are other forms of corporation of this kind. Franchising is another example, but McDonald's is the stores that have golden arches on them are not in the main owned by McDonald's. They are owned, operated by franchisees who benefit from the McDonald's branding. They benefit from the McDonald's manuals that tell them how to make these, these kind of things. Uh, and uh, the tells, for example, are the same. Uh, the, it's unlikely that a Marriott hotel is actually owned by Marriott. It will be owned by some consortium of investors who benefit from uh, the, the operations of the chain. We also have many platforms. We have companies like Google or Facebook, where the, the consumers of the product are also the suppliers of the product. And uh, uh, it's that kind of platform that is a service that, that, that Facebook provides. You have companies that are pure intermediaries, organizations like Uber, and Airbnb, which do nothing themselves, but simply put uh, suppliers in touch with customers. This is the hollow corporation. This is the world that has taken the division of labor to strengths uh, and lengths that no one could previously have imagined. So what does this mean if we have uh, now capital as a service provided by companies like uh, Aircap, book by planes to Mr. The World's Airlines, a company like Prologis, which is the supplier of uh, warehouse services to Amazon, a company like Equinex, which on the one hand provides the data center capacity to Amazon, and Amazon Web Services, which provides the computing capabilities uh, to a whole variety of corporations around the world. If we go back to Adam Smith and the, the pin factory, then even years, 50 years after the publication of the Wealth of Nations in, uh, in 1928, uh, the economic historian Sir John Clapham wrote, it is a pity, he said, that Adam Smith did not go a few miles from Kikordi to see the Karen works, to see them turning and boring their cannonades instead of his to his silly pin factory, 
which was only a factory in the wrong sense of the word. The Karen works uh, were at Stenhouse Mule outside Falkirk. The Karen works were certainly the largest industrial plant in Scotland, probably in Britain and quite possibly in the world in at the time Adam Smith was writing. And the Adam, the Karen works were uh, established, were, uh, uh, were an iron works. And uh, uh, Clapham erroneously talked about cannonades, but actually the this famous product of the Karen works were called carronades. And Napoleon actually blamed his defeat at the Battle of Trafalgar on the efficacy of the carronades with which Nelson's ships were armed, which enabled um, uh, uh, enabled Nelson uh, to to fire effectively and secure that victory. The carronades were a, a major product of the Karen works. The Karen works were established, and this was the model of how the industrial revolution typically evolved uh, by two families called the Cardells and the Garbets. These were people who had made money, who had original wealth derived from agricultural land. They then invested in that in various business activities. And some of these business activities were quite successful in these cases, and that has enabled them to establish this very large plant of the time uh, in, uh, in Falkirk. And it was an iron works. It fed on the collective intelligence which had then been developed so that it was based on uh, the same techniques that had been used in the Midlands of England uh, by the, uh, uh, the Colebrook Dale works and well, Abel and Derby and others. So they took the collective intelligence, they invested their capital, and they recruited labor from the fields of Scotland to man the works. And they also built housing for this uh, newly, uh, newly industrialized labor force so that there's still the houses, the current works of Holland have been shuttered for some time, but the houses, some of the houses uh, that they built there still exist. What happened then is that they took the wealth which they'd established from agricultural and earlier, earlier work in business. They invested it in these production facilities and they controlled what went on in these factories. That was what I call, I have called the, the tripart structure of work, which is the, the world that, uh, uh, it was how real business existed as far as it did exist in the time of Smith. We don't know what the organization of the pin factory was. It's not surprising that Smith didn't tell us about that since he, I think he never actually went there. Um, it's interesting if he had gone to a pin factory, the center of pin production in Europe was actually in Normandy, which is an interesting example of collective intelligence because there was a cluster of pin making firms in Normandy. Just as today, there's a cluster of uh, technology companies in Silicon Valley. In Kikordi, there was actually a cluster of nail makers. This clustering phenomenon has been a feature of the development of collective intelligence across the century. And it's still a feature today. If you go to Northern Italy, you will see it very well to Italy. Yeah, it, you will see in various places, these kind of clusters. Silk ties come from Como. Um, tailoring, if you have, a, or uh, you know someone who has an, an Italian suit, uh, it probably comes from Prato in Tuscany. And actually Prato is a center of Italian tailoring. Interestingly, you, if you buy a suit from Prato today, it will certainly have a label saying made in Italy but it's quite likely that it has never been touched by any Italian because a high proportion of the population of Prato today are Chinese who have immigrated legally or illegally to Italy and both learned the techniques of Italian tailoring and are still applying them in that particular cluster. The importance of collective intelligence in our organization of industry 
is reflected in the way in which we have these cluster phenomena. And we can see these cluster phenomena in all kinds of areas. The cluster uh, of nail makers in Kirkcaldy, which was Trevair when Smith was growing up, was a phenomenon of that time. And as I say, it may be that what he was writing about when he talked about the pin factory and put that emphasis on it was the way in which that cluster was being displaced by these kind of new techniques of mass production. So that we have this kind of cluster phenomenon and uh, that, uh, but that uh, was only part of what the, uh, the collective intelligence in clusters was part of what happened here. Uh, in terms of that tripartite structure, we had this historic movement from wealth to tangible capital to control of business, which was a, a kind of a organization of industry that Marx and others who were critics of the Industrial Revolution were writing about through the 20th century. In effect, the division of the inequality of wealth was translated into the class structure of business. So we had the capitalists and the proletariat. The capitalists had accumulated wealth. They translated that wealth into tangible physical investment and they took control of business and they bossed the pro proletariat uh, around in the light of that. But business isn't like that anymore. Firstly, uh, tangible capital does not have the same significance that it once did. And that is the most important point, perhaps, in all of this, to see that we now have capital as a structure as a service. Amazon and Apple and all the other companies I've been talking about buy in capital services in very much the same way that they buy in water or electricity or accounting. Amazon buys warehouse services. Amazon's customers buy cloud computing services and so on. Capital is now a service rather than being the centerpiece of the organization of production. So that it's no longer true that we have this tripartite structure running from personal wealth through to tangible capital to control of business. Tangible capital has dropped out of the, the middle of this. And uh, this is what things look like now. We still have a link between control of business and personal wealth, but it runs not from personal wealth to control of business. It runs from control of business to personal wealth. And who provides the tangible capital for the Amazon warehouse, the air cap planes, and the like? Well, the answer almost certainly is all of you in this room do that. That is where your pension fund savings go. That is where, if you buy diversified index funds or like, the money you invest there goes. It goes from dispersed savers to providing the tangible capital of the warehouses, the plant, things and like. What you can see from this is that the traditional categories of bourgeoisie and proletariat, of capitalists and workers, that were characteristic of business in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, when Smith was when Smith was failing to describe a phenomenon that's just emerging. These kind of Marxist categories no longer help us at all in understanding either the business or the, cap or the politics of the modern environment. It's just not like that anymore. And uh, what does that make this to in terms of uh, how our business operates? Well, the control of business to personal wealth is the phenomenon which we can't underestimate. I've never forgotten an occasion on which I uh, took uh, to talk to a class of mine at London Business School, a retired chief executive from a large British company, who had retired from that business um, in the late in the late nineteen seven in the late nineteen eighties, after his spending his life in that particular business, and at the end of the class, he said to me, having fielded questions and discussion from these MBA students. 
You know, he said, these kids regard being a chief executive as a prize, not a responsibility. And it seemed to me he put his finger on a key way in which business is developed and not developed for the better in the course of the 20th century. And a large part of what goes in business, on in business is the degree to which professional managers have risen to the top of these businesses and used them to enrich themselves. That's the way in which control of business now runs to personalized wealth and not the other way around. Some of you will have come across the widely quoted work of Thomas Piketty, which uh, purports to show that uh, inequality is steadily increasing, inequality of wealth is steadily increasing because of what he calls the iron law of capitalism, which, in, which means that the rate, rate of return on existing wealth exceeds the rate of growth in the economy. This, to my mind, is a complete under misunderstanding of why it is that we have the wealth inequalities which we do have in the modern economy. We have that as a result, and it's easy enough to look, if you simply look down the Forbes rich list to see who the people at the top of these lists are. They are people who have either created businesses or they have run businesses. All of them are essentially rich by virtue of wealth that has been created during their lifetime and has been created through the control of business. That's the new order. It runs from control of business to personalized wealth, and it runs from the dispersed savings, your pensions, your savings, the tangible capital of the, of the, uh, of the businesses like Amazon, Apple, and so on we've been talking about. So I began tonight this evening where Smith began in the Finn factory. And Clapham was right to point out that when Smith was writing, the pin factory was being overtaken as a description of business by the iron works of the Cardells and Garbets and the textile mills of, um, uh, of Sir Richard Arkwright. And in the century that followed, these kind of industrial activities would be supplemented and superseded by steel mills, automobile assembly lines, meat packing plants, uh, and the like. And if you go back to look at the leading companies of the world in the 1950s, that's who they were. They were automobile companies, they were steel companies, and some of them were food and meat packing companies. But these are not in the list of the world's largest companies anymore. If, we, if you look down that list, you come up with Apple and Amazon and these very different kinds of modern corporations. And uh, Rather oddly, we're now back closer to that pin factory and this coordinating activity between, uh, as it were, specialist activities as the description of how business works. It's closer, in a sense, to the worldview of business uh, than the categorization of work of Marx. The business environment which followed the Industrial Revolution came from the combination of physical labor and physical capital. That's what was going on in the current works that stand out as new. And even in, the 20, even in the 20th century, it was really what was going on in the great car assembly lines of, uh, of Michigan, of Halewood, and the like. But this tripartite linkage has gone. The linkage runs no longer from the control of business to personal wealth and the deployment of capital as a service means that tracing capital has very little to do with understanding the control of business. In our modern businesses, labor of many kinds of a labor in combination is the key factor of production. And output results not from people banging metal on the long production lines, but whether in the pin factory or the iron works, or the iron works or the car factory, it's from the associated skills, the software engineer, product designer, the accountant, the marketer, the rainmaker in the law firm and consultant, the deal maker in the city. That's where these are the key factors of production in our modern economy. 
So the iron works and the Nottingham Assembly lie are no longer the commanding heights of their economy, to use that traditional socialist Marxist phrase. What are the commanding heights now? They're Apple and Google, they're Verizon, Pfizer, PwC, companies like these. The employees of these kind of companies are not the proletariat of the Marxist story. They and they go to offices rather than factories. In the industrial before the industrial revolution, people more mostly worked from home. People stopped working from home when they went to work in factories with large scale equipment and um, uh, and needed the power which was generated centrally by them. Twenty first century, many of them are struggling yet again that they can start working from home because they don't need these kind of facilities. They themselves are the key factor of production, rather than requiring access to that kind of, uh, that kind of capital. So the products they produce are smartphones, internet search, bank accounts, connectivity, bills, accounting services, things that fit in your pocket or your head. Are, uh, and. Uh, with a de dematerialization of uh, production has gone the dematerialization of the production process. This is just some examples of uh, the dematerialization of production. We took a variety of products and asked what they cost per kilo. You can see how the resource content of products has steadily diminished relative to the intellectual content. The carronade, as I described, was, the, the, was the, the military technology that Napoleon believed had contributed to his defeat. And it cost, adjusted to current prices, which is a difficult thing to do, uh, but it will give you an idea of the order of magnitude. It cost two pounds per kilogram. Uh, this is the SAA, or ATA2. I'm not sure exactly what it looks like, but I gather that it's the mainstream rifle of the modern British army, and it costs 200 pounds. Uh, actually, the, the carronades, which were um, on Nelson's uh, ship at Trafalgar, weighed about the same as the most powerful weapon which has ever been produced, which is the hydrogen bomb, the, the atom bomb, that was dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. Fortunately, we couldn't get a price for the atom bomb. We're unable to put that in the same way in the table. But you get the idea. In terms of vehicles, the, the Model T Ford, when it came on the market, was the first product of the automobile assembly line. It cost £27 a kilo. The Airbus A380 costs um, about 50 times that per kilo. Even in terms of buildings, the Empire State Building was the tallest building in the world when it was built. And the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, which is the tallest building in the world today, cost about twice as much per kilo to build. In all of these, the value of the product now lies much more in its in the intellectual processes that go into it than do, the, than do the, uh, uh, than the resources. And realizing this is an answer to the people who talk, as more and more people do now, about resources and resource limitations and even the need for degrowth. People who say these kind of things have not really understood what growth is about. It is about better stuff rather than more stuff. That's what we've been largely, been largely been achieving. The first mobile phone came on the market in, um, uh, in 1984. It weighed about half a kilo, which is quite a lot. It certainly didn't fit in your pocket. Indeed, it was hard to fit in your briefcase. Uh, and it cost 5,000 uh, pounds. The iPhone calculated the weight of that. And um, it's uh, uh, it's more like a hundred grams and a half a kilo, 
and uh, it costs five thousand pounds a kilo, and it does really rather a lot more than that first mobile phone did. And of course, we couldn't finish this without looking at the pin. Uh, we couldn't go back, go back to uh, Adam Smith's pin factory, I'm afraid. But if we got we got it the early 19th century, we could get a kilo of pins for about 11 pounds. Speculated on what was the most expensive product per kilo on the market today, and came up with a, the Pfizer a COVID vaccine, which costs about 500,000 pounds per kilo. You will realize, of course, that you don't need very much of it to be effective. That's the epitome of the idea that the value of the product lies not in the, the raw materials that go into it, but in the, the human capabilities, the collective knowledge that is built into it. So, but labor is the key to, uh, is the key to the theory of the world. And two things I hope you will take away. One is that the kind of uh, Marxist dialogue of capital and labor, workers and capitalists, has very little effective ability or utility in understanding what is going on on in modern business. In modern business, the workers are the, female, the means of production. That's the reason why we have collective intelligence dominating the cost of these kind of products. We need to think about the firm in terms of collections of capabilities. And if we understand that a firm is a combination of capabilities and entrepreneurship, which is real business, is the activity of putting together these combinations of capabilities. We will start to understand how business has evolved from the time of Adam Smith and the Pin Factory, the modern world of the iPad. Well, we've ranged not just over um, everything from the pin to the iPhone, but I think around the world several times. And um, I'm sure that set off various thoughts in your minds as to where does that lead us? How does this explain what we see day by day? How does it explain what's in the press? How is it that our um, various commentators seem to have got the wrong end of the stick? Can we understand things a bit more? So. I'd invite our two um, microphone um, rovers to come down and uh, if we can uh, think about uh, what questions you'd like to put to Sir John, um, please um, do take the opportunity to ask a question rather than to give another lecture, if that's possible. Well done. Thank you. Right. So, um, anybody got a question? Yes. One uh, just there, Graham, on your three rows, four rows back. Hey, thank you very much for a fascinating lecture. A uh, perhaps a question, since you started a bit with with tax. A um, how does society? tax this change, what, what response is needed to this development? Gosh, that's quite a challenging question. And I should explain when Richard talked about the book I wrote with Melvin King way back in the 1980s, uh, that we haven't been spending very much of our time and energy on tax since then. Um, if I, if I'm to come back to what is probably the key element in that. We had understood even then that tax only works fairly well if you attach a location to the thing which you are taxing. And possibly the biggest way in which tax has been affected by the developments I'm describing is that it becomes more and more difficult to uh, 
to pin down the location of any particular active economic activity. Uh, the, the cost of the raw material, which, which go into that iPhone, are trivial relative to the price at which the iPhone is ultimately uh, sold. But where is the value added in that particular chain running from the raw materials to the finished product in your pocket? Where is that value added? Is it in California? Is it, is it in mainland China? Is it in Taiwan where TSMC produce the chips which are part of it? Is it in Korea where Samsung makes the cameras and so on? Where is the value added? If I take, we have a Pfizer COVID vaccine at the bottom. And if we take the pharmaceutical industry as an example, you undertake research in some country, you manufacture the product in another, you sell it in a, in a third. What, how do you divide the value added, which is created in that production process between the two, between the three? And that's why I think it's, it's so much more difficult to find tax regimes that meet Smith's criteria in the 21st century than it was in, in earlier times. And uh, I think people talk about uh, having global wealth taxes and the like are people who have just not thought even for a more than, more than a minute or two about the practical problems in, in um, uh, implementing tax regimes in worlds which are as connected and as diverse as they are today. Yes. Thanks again. Um, one of the corollaries of the move from Adam Smith's time from personal wealth leading to gain of control of business to now control of the business being the producer of personal wealth is that even since the mid 20th century, the wealth of the CEO of a big company is now hugely multiples of the average worker in that business, much more so than it was 60, 70 years ago. Is that a good thing or a justifiable thing? Uh, I don't think it is. And I go back to that exchange I described with a retired CEO who said being a CEO is a responsibility, not a prize. And that was the view he took of it. And I think he was absolutely right to say that uh, now these people doing MBO courses are, incli are more inclined to regard climbing up the corporate ladder as a prize. And he was rather shocked to discover recently uh, that Stanford Business School actually runs a course which is uh, really on how to become a CEO, how to navigate the corporate ladder so you will come out at the top of it and be the person who um, who benefits from all the kind of things you've been describing that have changed this world. Your thesis seems to admit a whole area of industry, uh, namely the service industries. Uh, in which the raw material is the, the human resources, uh, everything from cleaning hotel rooms to high-powered healthcare. Where does it fit into uh, the, the, the your thesis of, of, of uh, control of capitalism? I think, as I'm arguing, the world is just not like that anymore. I don't think the term capitalism helps us. Uh, one commentator has praised it uh, as saying all businesses need water and electricity, but we don't talk about waterism or electricityism as describing how the, how the modern economy works. And what I've tried to argue is that it, in the world of capital as a service, the Amazon warehouse and their van and the data center and the like are really just like electricity and water and by continuing to use this term capitalism i, I would prefer to, to manage without it actually. 
wondering if I could ask one, just um, your thing about the division of labor. I'm just wondering in the world's economy, whether we've taken it so far that the world has become a fragile place. You've picked up perhaps one of the prime examples, the Taiwan uh, semiconductor manufacturing plant. But I think there are others uh, around that um, if they, for, for any reason, sort of uh, failed, the, the, there's the danger of the whole system collapsing. And perhaps in a previous era, when there were several people doing the same sort of thing, um, there wasn't this division of labor and there was more robustness in the world economy. Is there a danger with this division of labor that things can be become fragile? I think there is such a danger. And we discovered that danger during the, the pandemic, or it was certainly a reminder of that kind of fragility. And the Taiwanese um, dominance of semiconductors is a very good example of that. We, and is there an answer to it? Right, I think, I think the answer has to be not abandoning the division of labor, but of diversifying sources of supply. So that, for example, one response has been that Apple overwhelmingly assembled its products in mainland China. It is now starting to do it in India as well. And that's, I think, a response to the kind of things that are being described, described here, and a sensible response, uh, which would be very different from manufacturing in California, which would be costly, and probably not done particularly well. It's quite boring, assembling a smartphone. Yes, it's along there. Hi, um, you talked about the successes <clears throat> arising from, from this model you presented. Uh, I think what I'm worrying about is the failures that we see a society in which an increasing number of people who are employed use food banks in order to feed themselves and their children. We see problems with our infrastructure, with our NHS system, and you outlined the problems with taxation. How do you how do you find the value added to take tax from it to fund these services? How in this new world order do we provide a society which is successful? I mean, I think it's not very difficult to describe a society which is an aggregate an aggregate successful. We have one. That is not to say that people share fairly and equally in that success. They don't. And I think we've hinted at one or two of the sources of problems here. The explosion of executive remuneration, the growth of a large swath of not very productive activities in the financial sector, and so on, are things we need to address. Uh, but we need, we need to accept the reality of these changes in the nature of production and the nature of the production process. Before we take one or two at the front, is there anybody in the back half of the hall that would like to ask a question? Campbell, there's somebody, uh, third row back with the red pullover. Hello from the back. Is uh, AI a rapid route to collective intelligence? It's AI. A lack of is is AI a rapid route to collective intelligence? Um, it, it, it kind of exemplifies collective knowledge. The challenge of AI is the extent to which it can be turned into collective intelligence, as distinct from collective knowledge. We have this ability to handle masses of data in a way that we could never have dreamed of before, turning them into effective problem-solving capabilities is another matter altogether. And the next two or three decades will demonstrate how successful we can be at doing that. But it's, it, it's a very interesting question. And AI raises a whole range of issues about the nature of collective intelligence that I don't feel competent to solve and I don't hear people talking about it we sound competent to solve it either. You mentioned the new companies that don't actually produce anything themselves, like Apple and Amazon and so on. What is the role for the old-fashioned 
big manufacturing still, because we still want to buy a car, or for that matter, an Airbus or whatever. Where do they fit in now? Yeah. I mean, if you look at my list, there are still manufactured products on it. But the value of the manufacturing, uh, whether it's the Airbus or the Pfizer vaccine or the iPhone, the value of the manufacturing lies not in the physical product, but in the collective intelligence that goes into it. You still want to buy a car, but a, a car, an electric car you will buy even now, certainly a decade from now, uh, is uh, an intelligent vehicle in a way that the, the Model T Ford, or indeed the car you bought 10 years ago, never was and never could be. So again and again, you see the extent to which the products we we buy are the value of them rests much more in the incorporated collective intelligence and less and less in the raw materials that which make it up. Yeah. Or so. What part do you think the intensification of labour has played in economic growth and will play in future economic growth? Sorry, the intensification of labour. Intensica intensification of labour. I.e. we want the... I mean, more and more the product... Co the companies companies, companies want about, more and more from their employees. Uh, are, 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 as I was describing, the result of, of labour. Do we think that the code coder in Google uh, or the, the research scientists developing the Pfizer vaccine are being exploited? I don't think so. Uh, they are the business in a way that was not remotely true of the of the car of the car and the, the car and works or the pin factory. I was surprised that you summarized very interestingly the current state of the economy, yeah. or whatever you choose to call it, without mentioning anything about climate change and the incapacity of our current system, it would appear, to address that. Thank you. I think we could have a long, we could have, and people do have long sessions talking about climate change. I don't think the issues I've raised tonight have much to contribute to that discussion, uh, or that the issues about the changing the nature of business have very much direct relevance to that. Uh, can I can I just ask a question about the uh, the runaway train that we have here in the economics? Do we have a runaway train that, when we look at the economic situation across the UK? Sorry, what is a runaway train? Well, in terms of uh, you know, you talk about evolving uh, economics here, and um, uh, we've got to the stage of having iPhones and so forth. But uh, we have an, uh, inequalities between uh, the labour and between the, uh, the people who hold the money. But uh, have we not got a runaway train situation here? Well, there are various versions of that story. One, which I hope the slide up there answers, is the story that we're exhausting resources. The resource we're using primarily in these products is human ingenuity, and that's not exhaustible. Uh, you talk about ever-increasing inequality. I wish people would talk about inequality. We'd talk a bit more about inequality of what and where and when. Uh, we've had an increase in income inequality in the UK and in the United States over the last 30 to 40 years, which has been driven by two main things. One is the, um, is the growth of uh, executive remuneration, and the other is expansion of the financial sector. These are issues 
which I think we need to address and get under control. In terms of the broader income distribution in the UK, it is not, in fact, uh, uh, widened very much. In terms of distribution of wealth, our data is fairly flimsy on that. Uh, but what, what is certainly true is that wealth in Britain is more widely dispersed than it was a century ago, because more people have some wealth than did a, they, they did a century ago. On the other hand, we do have some very large uh, uh, fortunes at the top of the distribution. If we're talking about global inequality, we get very different figures. Because one of the extraordinary things about what has happened in my lifetime has been the reduction in extreme poverty, in particularly in Asia, India, China, and the like. Uh, people talk about inequality as if it's an established and inevitable fact that it has grown and continues to increase. It is not. It is a more complicated phenomenon, and we need to be more specific about what is meant and by the causes of that. I was at a conference, it's actually just before the pandemic, so I guess I can place the date, in Berlin. And a uh, person in the audience uh, speaking talked about inequality is greater than it ever has been in the world. And I looked round and people were nodding in agreement. I thought, stand back for a moment. Where we were having that conference was in a street called Schlossplatz. It was a street called Schlossplatz because it was where the Winter Palace of the Hohenzollerns in Berlin was actually built. That palace was um, badly damaged by Allied bombing during the Second World War and was then finally demolished by the East German regime. Rather astonishingly, the East German regime erected uh, their own sort of palace, the council building of the state building of the DDR on that, on that site. It's probably the only place in the world where you will see a stained glass window with a hammer and sickle in it. But I promise you that is what most strikes you when you enter that particular building. More bizarrely still, it is now um, uh, the location of a, a Berlin business school, which has the ham and sickle in the, in the front lobby. And it, that was why the conference was being, well, not that, the ham and sickle isn't why the conference was being held there. It was because of a business school today. Um, is inequality greater than it was in Louis XIV's day? Is the gap between Bernard Arnault, who's now France's richest man, and the average French person greater than that between Louis XIV and the average French person? I don't even know how you would try to answer that question. Uh, Louis XIV never flew in a private jet, never had an antibiotic when he got ill, and so on. Uh, people talk about inequality in these rather hand-waving terms, and I wish they would stop and be firstly specific about what it is they mean, and secondly, be ready to underlie, to analyze in some specific detail, rather than general terms about iron laws of capitalism, the causes of the phenomenon they're talking about. Wow, well, that's quite some uh, thing to note to end on, um, John. So thank you very much. Can I hand over to um, Pat, our president, um, for a quick um, thank you. I hope you can all hear me. Um, so it falls to me to thank uh, John for giving us uh, the lecture that he's given us which I don't know about you, but it's made me think about things that I haven't really thought about very much. I felt he's taken on us on a rather, at least I found it a chilling journey from when people made things and they sold them to people who needed them. And they got the capital to do that from people who had money. Okay, that, that wasn't a great system necessarily, but now we're faced with this huge 
rise in the middleman and the importance of not the people who can make things, but the people who can make things happen. And their capital, if you like, is inside their head. And what I'm finding difficult to answer for myself is, is that a good thing? Does that spread potential? Or does it make the society that we live in all the poorer because of this huge middle in which people don't really make anything? And I don't know the answer, but I'm going to think about it. And I'd like to thank John for making us and making all of us think about these kinds of things. I have... Works with, with great pleasure on behalf of the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow that I present John with the Society's Adam Smith Medal. Thank you. And of course, with the Society paperweight. <laughs> and, and please have a glass of wine and continue to think. Thank you. <laughs>